uh, is uh, is shown on on the uh, on the left hand side with the blue curve. That would that trajectory would give from Fisher Money alone until two uh, until two thousand uh, two hundred uh, three centimeters of of sea level rise. I think I needed. Something's being recorded, but you still see the screen, I hope. Um, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope this, you don't mind. We like to record these and put them on, on YouTube. No, no. That's, uh, okay. Is that OK? That's OK. I, I, I had some technical issues getting that going just now. Um, but it's, it's now. No worries. Yeah. So um, th there is a projection out there that says uh, within 200 years, this, this ice shelf alone or the, the behind lying ice sheet can contribute to three centimeters to, to global sea level. Um, but then also the, the graph on the lower left shows kind of the spread of ocean warming uh, in the in the CMIP, uh, CMIP 5 uh, climate model zoo and also comparing this new simulation that Ralph did with, with another with PESOM ocean model and, and the red curve showing the original simulations from Hartmut um, showing quite a range of temperature increase uh, there. So um, kind of interesting to find out what's really going on here. Um, and to look back a bit, what does actually trigger this change? And uh, there uh, we made a paper in 2017 reanalyzing the same experiments as from the 2012 paper, looking at what is actually changing. And it's, it's two things that are changing. Um, if you see, uh, one thing that's the upper panel is that the, the warm water, uh, off-shelf warm water is actually rising uh, to shallow depth in that model, which makes it accessible onto the continental shelf. And at the same time, the middle panel, this production of dense, uh, dense shelf water is decreasing in that uh, simulation because of changes in the atmosphere um, that, that remove kind of a dense water barrier here on the continental uh, shelf that then lets the warm water to go in. And that is really these two things, and I will come back to that, is, is what triggers the change. But once the change is going, what this 2017 paper showed is that um, if you reverse to a cold atmospheric forcing, um, actually the melt rates don't go back to the, the cold level that has been there before, but they stay at sort of a warm level. So, so this is a, the traditional hysteresis behavior of a, of a tipping point where you have, um, uh, where you can reach uh, two different states depending on the initial, initial conditions. And only in these experiments, if, um, if melt rates were forced back to, to be low, uh, they, for, for a little while, uh, the model would go back to the trajectory of little melting. So there was a direct feedback between the melting itself and the warm inflow. And that, uh, if you notice that I talked about dense water and dense water blocking, that feedback is very simple, explained by once you got melting on, you got fresh water input, and then you re re remove what could be a dense water barrier. So that's, that's this tipping point, uh, makes an irreversible change. Um, and that has recently also been detailed out more, more carefully actually by a paper that, that really puts up a conceptual model forward for that and, and shows that this is really happening. So uh, fr from this works, I think we can be confident that such a tipping point can exist, but we don't really exist is how far are we from triggering it? Can we trigger it? And, and there's really a wide range. And recently there was a, uh, there was um, the, the ISMIP-6 uh, exercise where, where this has been tried to delineate it with, with the help of ice models, uh, what does this all contribute to sea level rise? But stepping up, going a step back to force your ice models, you actually need to tell them something about the ocean. And that wasn't particularly easy uh, to do that. So um, how was this done? Uh, since, since I was a bit involved in deriving that forcing, I just want to give a little bit insights on, on what actually has happened there to, to uh, arrive at these results from this uh, sea level projections. And I already mentioned one thing was this, um, this change at the continental shelf break, warm water getting onto the continental shelf. And that is something we were looking at in the CMIP models. How do they represent the slope front? 
on the bottom here, you actually see high resolution observations of the slope front. And then all these panels show how that slope front looks like in 19 different CMAP models. Well, and the conclusion is they all look different and nothing looks like the observations. So this is basically what we started off to, to force the, the sea level projections of the ice sheets. Um, Luckily, there are some observations and uh, these observations the, the, that are available have been grown uh, for the continental shelf regions of Antarctica in particular by use of these instrumented seal data uh, that is covering a lot of parts that are not covered by the traditional ship data. So not being able to rely on absolute values in the CMIP models, we constructed a, an ice sheet model forcing by first building an inventory of as good as possible realistic ocean temperatures and then on top of that add the anomalies from the SEMA projections to to drive the changes i mean not only under fish and ronnie ice but really circumantarctic and that was the general protocol that we derived for that um but again if we if we look back at fish and ronnie ice or, or weddell sea this is how changes look like in the slope front um, and the the typical picture of the thermocline that is pushed down here you don't really have a strong temperature contrast here you see it a bit better um, but there are there are really two modes in all this uh, all these simulations either the, um, the the thermocline is moving upwards that's that's uh, the different uh, contours here or the temperatures of the subsurface water are warming and uh, actually, in, in many models, you see uh, either or, or, if, or a mixture of both. So, so everything is kind of possible. Um, and we made then, this is how this reflects in, in continental shelf temperatures. And uh, again, we, we need to force kind of the, the continental shelf uh, uh, regions with ocean temperatures from, from climate models that, that do not include the ice shelf melting feedback either, and that coarsely resolve the shelf at all. But still, the Southern Weddell Sea has one of the largest continental shelf regions in the Antarctica. So that's probably the reason where, where these models still are doing the best job, if they do a, do a good job anyway. Um, so, so these are the different forcing shapes. And uh, Chris Little looked a bit more into that, how kind of uh, off-shelf temperature, um, slope temperature, map onto shelf temperature. and for many reasons, there's a good relationship, but actually exactly in the Weddell Sea, this relationship is not so clear. It's more, it's more kind of a threshold behavior. You, your slope temperature is changing in the model and suddenly you get that strong increase of, of warm water onto the shelf. And a lot of that really boils down to how the slope front is represented in, in the particular model that you're using that. Um, and that's, that's what, that was the reason why I originally was very skeptical towards uh, Hartmut's 2012 paper, because that model he used had a very similar resolution to these uh, CMIP models that you see here. A bit, uh, one big difference is it did include ice shelf cavities, but really in terms of representing the processes at the shelf break, that's, that's not a big difference. Still, uh, looking at, at the CMIP zoo again, all the different models, they show kind of a consistent trajectory both for the on-shelf and off-shelf range where over half a century or half into the century some changes are happening and if you take the uh, ensemble average then it's kind of a smooth curve and that is similar as this trend of a rising thermocline in the in the Helmut 2012 paper but really if you look at the different models uh, there are there are quite quite some differences both in timing and in magnitude what is happening here um, and really, my, my, my strongest impression from this whole ISMIP 6 exercise was that well, if we see these changes happening in the second half of, of this century, then for an ice sheet projection, really running a model until 2000, uh, to 2100 is really too short to actually see the response, the ice dynamic response of, of such, a, such an ocean warming signal that comes that late. Uh, I mean, there are only 30 years for the ice to respond, and we, we know that on ice dynamic timescales, this is, this is uh, very short. Um, so we had then 
this different approach, and this was what originally I mentioned was the Norwegian <clears throat> project that was funded where we proposed, well, we're going to make a very high resolution regional uh, model and uh, kind of use that for process studies, uh, do our artificial experiments where we can do uh, whatever we want to it, but still kind of tied into uh, observations that we have so that we know that we're working within a realistic framework uh, in terms of ocean dynamics. So this is um, something that has been then going on together with people at University of Bergen. Um, and one challenge for, for such a high resolution model is of course, if you make it regional, you need good boundary conditions because otherwise uh, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so for that, uh, we try to construct these boundary conditions in particular for this inflow region where you have this narrow slope front uh, based on observations. So again, using a lot of seal data, but also all ship data, uh, we derived the climatology of, of this slope front and the thermocline depth and, and the shape structure of all this and provided that as an inflow boundary condition for the model uh, there are, of course, more open boundaries. They were then uh, tapered by, by other model, larger, larger scale model output data that we use. But really, we try to like, tie in uh, the, the, the internal solution by, by the observations. And uh, this is what we're getting in terms of hydrography now, only showing temperature. But all these circles show where there have been moorings standing at least for a year in the open motion and under the ice shelf. Uh, and, and the colors show kind of the, the model bias. So uh, white is almost no bias, and then green is a bit more bias, and red is the worst. And really out here, we have one that, that is the worst, and that's 0.3 degrees off, which compared to the CMIP models, which are sometimes more than two degrees off, is, is already better. Um, but um, yeah, I will come back to that. For the, but the others are all quite in the, in the range. And also uh, for the... For the melt rate map, uh, if one compares this pattern with uh, satellite uh, estimates or, or other estimates, that, that's kind of what, what you usually expect in the melt rate pattern under filter Ronnie ice shift looks like when you include tides and, and all that in the uh, ocean circulation. So yeah, there was this one mooring that, that had a larger bias uh, and that was uh, compared to, to a time series. We're happy that we're at least getting the seasonal cycle right. This is, uh, this is the time series. But generally, so this lower part is what is captured by the observations and it's generally a little bit too warm. Um, so our take was then, okay, it's slightly too warm. So our model would rather overestimate warm inflows than underestimate warm inflows. That's why we're kind of okay with being more than 0.3 degree off there. <clears throat> so then, um, from the earlier paper, we had the idea there's an, there's an off-shelf driver, the warm water goes up along the shelf break, and there's an on-shelf driver, we seize the, the production of dense water. Uh, so let's play with our process model uh, and, and see what these two changes do to the warm inflow and to, um, to the changes. Um, so we designed two different tests. One test basically uh, taking, oh, sorry taking the, the thermocline here, modifying the inflow boundary conditions and making it more like in the Bellingshausen Sea that we don't have such a strong slope front and see what happens. Well, and surprisingly, actually by lifting the upper thermocline by 400 meters, so really making this a, a flat thing, not a front anymore, um, the warm water does not enter the Filchner trough, which is the conduit for warm water to get into the ice shift cavity, but it, it floods the Eastern continental shelf part uh, and stays there. And uh, Hashti, um, who did these experiments, she did another idealized study looking at the potential vorticity dynamics in the sill region. And she can show that it's just, the water is just not, not able to, to enter here because of this density barrier at, at the sill that exists there. So then the second experiment or the second test was, uh, and I apologize for showing such a large TS diagram without taking the time to explain it, but uh, Basically, you have the, the dotted lines are density contours, and you have this very dense high salinity shelf water, which is formed in, mainly in front of the Ronny ice shelf. And we artificially decrease the density of this water mass in a scenario 
where uh, it's decreased somewhat and in a scenario where it's decreased very much. Uh, so we basically remove this density barrier. And again, we don't see the signal of warm water getting very far into the uh, Fischner cavity. We more see a warming of the, uh, of the uh, western shelf in front of the Ronnie ice shelf. Uh, also an interesting result, but really not what has happened in the, in the Helmer scenario and, and really not that strong warm inflow and also not increasing the melt rate so extremely as, as we've seen before. But only really if we do both changes together, so the upstream offshore uh, shallowing of the warm water and the removal of the density barrier together, then suddenly kind of uh, warm water is at the right place and there's nothing blocking it. So then the cavity is flushed and then we get exactly that, that behavior that um, the other studies have predicted. So why is this relevant or why is this important? Um, I said confidently before that we deliberately tuned this model to be close to reality. So uh, we, we believe that these experiments are kind of trustworthy in terms of how strong of a perturbation you really need to have in the climate system or in the ocean in this region to, to trigger this change that has been predicted by, by the climate model. Um, yeah, and this is just the, the summary once again. Uh, this is how it looks like today, a cold fish and trough, which is this conduit. And then in the combined experiment of a shallow th uh, thermocline and remove density barrier, you get that warm inflow. And that is really what imprints on the melt rates where all these other experiments where, where we do all the other changes that, that, I mean, it does some changes, but it, it's not, not a multiplication of melt rates as you would get when you have this full warm inflow. Yeah, just uh, summarizing things once more, um, to reproduce these scenarios, you need to do both changes, remove that density barrier, which, which is lying here and lift up the warm water at the shelf break. That, that was the result of this study. So from that, um, we actually can derive two simple questions for the fate of, of fish and running ice shift in the future climate. How stable is this density barrier? And uh, how variable is the thermocline depth along the slope? And um, that are the other aspects, uh, uh, two other aspects of this talk that I, that I want to look a bit more into. Um, and while this was done on this uh, Norwegian modeling project, the question of how stable is this density barrier uh, was more where we should move to, to the actual observations. And this, I guess, uh, many of you have seen this on the, on the past conferences. Um, we, we, there has been quite an intense uh, observation program mainly by, done by, by Bas and Avi joining logistics and joining uh, science thoughts. And uh, well, I had, I had a postdoc position in, in that project basically, uh, joining this uh, drilling season on, on Fischner ice shelf, putting, putting out um, uh, moorings through these drill holes. This, uh, these drill holes have been completed by Bas uh, together with uh, Svein Österhus from Norway before, but then these were really the, the collaborating um, drill sites and um, they were put in place in, in the years that are shown here uh, where I'm still uh, getting emails from, from these loggers every day on my mobile phone so that worked fine um, and it was not a lightweight operation this is like for one drilling camp we had like 10 twin otter loads uh, some were uh, five hours or whatever away from from Rothera to get there with the uh, few links in between and so on so um, yeah quite a quite an undertaking. You've probably seen uh, pictures of hot water drilling rigs before. That's, uh, this is a sunny one, uh, nicely lined up the, the, the water reservoir and some, some heaters, some pumps, some generators, and along holes, and then uh, pumping water into the ice shelf. Uh, at the thickest, I think we went through 900 meters. The northern sites were about 650 meters deep. Yes. Um, that's what you have left at the surface, solar panel and some loggers, and then sending data from these beautiful instruments back home, uh, recording temperature and currents. And um, 
finally this year, even though that project has ended a long time ago, I managed to write up the results from, from these observations uh, and uh, trying to link some changes that we see in the cavity circulation to a large scale atmospheric circulation. So um, on, on the right side here already is the summary. We basically see two different circulation modes in the cavity and we see a shift between them and we can link that shift to an increase in, in uh, high synergy shelf water formation in this region since 2015 and onwards. Um, the single pieces are probably not big news or large surprises, but putting that all together into one consistent story and having really being able to follow these mechanisms with the ob observations through the cavity, that's probably the, the main contribution of this which uh, gives us some ideas of where we should look in the future to, to understand what's happening. But step back, what did we actually observe? Um, so here is now a time series of uh, these northern moorings, uh, vertical uh, temperature in time. And when we were there, we were observing something that we called warm temperatures. It's almost at the freezing point, just below the freezing point. Um, and then not with the seasonality, not in, no, no strong seasonality. We see a slow decrease to colder temperatures. Um, that's, uh, if you see the, the red and the blue, that's uh, two years apart uh, in March, January to March, and then January to March, two years later. So we go from uh, almost minus 1.9 degrees to kind of minus 2.2. It's still not a vast change, but it's, it is a change, and that can be linked to uh, different source water masses, how, how we like to call that. Um, either a source water mass that we leave comes from, from this Bergner Island region or a source water mass that comes from the Vonne region. And how, how can this be done? Yes, that's because inside the ice cavity, um, regarding any, uh, disregarding any other sources of, uh, of water, disregarding things like subglacial runoff or whatever, water can only be transformed because it's interacting with the ice shelf. And interacting with the ice shelf is either melting or freezing. And when you melt, you cool the water and you freshen the water because there's melt water adding to it. So your, your change of the water mass in the temperature salinity space is, along, is with a constant slope along a constant line, which is the ratio of the heat capacity of water and the latent heat of fusion uh, uh, of that water. So uh, we can relate that, uh, we can relate these water masses if they are changing along these lines uh, to different source water masses uh, at the temperature of, of the surface freezing point. Very quick, um, but yeah, I just jump here. And these source water masses um, with higher salinity, 34.8, or lower uh, salinity, 34.7, they are found in different places along the filtron running ice shelf front. Um, this, is, this is observations from 94 uh, or 95, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is observations taken in, in 2018. And uh, surprisingly, it, lo it looks surprisingly similar uh, with uh, many years, actually decades apart. The structure doesn't change very much. So we're confident that this interpretation of the different sources is, is correct. Um, another thing that can be seen when this is happening, when the cooling is happening, we also have an APUS installed here. We also see a decrease in melting uh, at the ice front here. Natural, if there's colder water, it's, uh, it's less melting there. Um, and connecting all that together, we have these other moorings. We actually see pulses of this Ronne source water propagating through the cavity uh, from here to there to there that, that kind of show us this, this switch, this mode switch from uh, a circulation where there's an inflow of local Bergner high salinity shelf water at the beginning of the time series, and then a remotely driven circulation where this Ronne uh, mode is, is dominating. And the same is also reflected in cross-section along the ice shelf front taken here in 2017, again showing similar like here, uh, freezing point temperatures all the way to the bottom. And then a year later, nothing of that is left. We have this very cold ice shelf water that has traveled through the cavity already and is coming out. 
So a quick side note, um, we also have current meters here. And of course you would ask how do those currents change and so on. A bit disappointing in this ice shelf, a lot of the circulation or a lot of the flow, uh, the circulation energy, the, the currents are dominated by tides. So this is a scatter of, of, um, of the uh, flow velocities at one of the sites. And really this tiny blue thing is if you take the time average is the mean time vector. So you have almost half a meter per second tidal currents. And on top of that, you have a residual mean flow of maybe three to five to 10 centimeters per second. So uh, it's, it's quite hard to interpret a direct flow change because the tides are so dominant. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a typical question that comes, I take it in, in round. So we've been talking about this. Um, eventually, we ended up with the interpretation that we have this change from the Bergner mode, where we have the local inflow of high energy shelf water at the filtration ice shelf front to a runner mode where it's, it's, it's a coherent circulation through the entire cavity that is driven by that remote high energy shelf water source. Now, this is also the runner mode is also the one that actually supplies us with this very dense outflow water because the, um, looking back here, even though the temperatures of these two water masses are different, the densities are not so different. They are very similar in density. But now if you consider that this was the only water that was filling the cavity, it would start melting the ice. And by that it would become ice shelf water that is colder, but fresher. So it would become lighter. So if the Bergner source would be the, the, um, the, only, the only source water mass here, we would actually produce lighter outflowing ice shelf water than if we have a runner source that, that is coming from, from a denser uh, high salinity shelf water. So that's, even though the water has become uh, uh, colder, it, it's also uh, the mode for, for the denser water that, that is uh, providing this, this blocking effect uh, at the filtration trough sill. Yes. Um, Going one step further back, we see we have seedless pulses going through. In addition to the pulses, we can also trace down that um, sea ice formation rates in the Ronne Polinia in these years have actually been above the long-term average. So green is the long-term average here. And that's, that's kind of the, the, uh, the, the orange ones are the annual averages for those uh, periods. So um, th there's a link of this change to the ice formation in the Ronne Polinia. And that led us to establish this connection and look further back in time of this uh, sea ice formation rate estimate, which is really just a proxy of, of sea ice uh, concentration and, and atmospheric reanalysis. But there you see there have been some exceptional years when this change has happened. And before that, it has been a period that is really quiet. And there was even a special paper about that ca called this a period of decline and then in 98, you had a strong pulse, which Keith Nichols has already uh, written about. And then there has been some variability before again. But um, different than the projections that tell us that this region is supposed to be getting warmer and fresher, we don't really see this trend. Rather, in 2015, we have seen an upswing of this, high, uh, of this uh, dense water formation, which actually has reinforced this um, this uh, dense water blocking. Um, I don't want to say this is this is like climate change is not happening or whatever. Uh, these are very short time scales, but uh, this is more pointing. Uh, this time this is more pointing at a interannual variability than a consistent trend, as uh, as is seen in in this uh, model simulations. So and of course we try to understand what is driving this interannual variability, and for that. Um, taking all these event blue dots where we say there was enhanced uh, sea ice formation rates, how did the atmosphere look, look like at that time? And what stands out is in color, you see here the wind speed. So that's the offshore winds blowing off the continent and opening up that polynia where sea ice is being formed. Um, and I did a lot of more detailed uh, investigations. It, it really is not 
the temperature that control in, in this region or the precipitation or whatever, but it is, it is a lot the wind that controls uh, whether, whether these pollinias are very active or not. And uh, from this composite, it also appears that it's not only the catabatic winds, but the reinforcement of the catabatic winds by a synoptic scale pattern or a larger scale pattern with, um, with a high pressure anomaly and a low pressure anomaly that, that supports the cyclonic circulation in this, in this entire region to, to open up uh, this, this pollinia here. Um, and uh, taking that even a bit further, uh, defining a, an index for the pressure anomaly here and an index for the pressure anomaly here, they can be related, uh, not super strongly, but to some extent, uh, to the, the southern annual mode, which uh, is then correlated with, with this low pressure anomaly, which is kind of not too unexpected that uh, low pressure close to the continent is, is uh, correlated with an, with an increased uh, SAM index. Um, but more surprising, this, uh, or not surprising, but more insightful probably, this high pressure anomaly in the eastern Bellinghausen Sea uh, is related to the, uh, the longitudinal position of the Amundsen Sea low. So sort of if the low is moving further uh, westward, then it gives rise for a high, uh, high pressure in this region. And then this in combination with the low pressure here uh, supports the, um, the, um, the offshore winds that, that drive the sea ice formation. Um, and while, while there's a, a general trend of this increasing uh, SAM, that is kind of consistent with stronger low pressure anomalies here in this region. Um, there, there has been there has been a, a shift from the Amundsen Sea low uh, towards um, a, a more westward position that then uh, coincides with with the high pressure anomalies in this region. These these were really the years where both these things fall together, where we have this strong uh, sea ice formation um, events. So uh, from from this analysis, we can't really judge if this is anyhow related to shifts in climate or trends in climate or whatever, but at least it gives us an idea what are at this time the controlling handles of the system, what, what, what is really driving the changes here. And, and I think uh, in particular this uh, Amundsen Sea Low uh, connection is something that we should look at more in, in, into the future and probably also in, in climate simulations. So Quickly summing up uh, this question one: How stable is this? Um, how stable is this uh, density barrier? We have recently enhanced sea ice formation in the Southern Weddell Sea due to a change in atmospheric spheric circulation that gave us the change in the circulation under the cavity. And all this happens actually with a two-year delay. Uh, things need to go through the cavity and come out two years later. Um, indicating that these changes have been, they are supporting a strengthening of, of, of the barrier on this, uh, on this a few year timescales. So that's a little bit contrasting to, to model projections, which go kind of one direction, it's getting warmer, it's getting wetter. Uh, right now we have summertime temperatures of minus 20 degrees here. So there, there needs to be quite some warming until, until the pollinias are not uh, effective anymore. But more important, probably, this indicates us uh, uh, the Amundsen Sea Low as, as kind of an early warning indicator uh, of, of changes in this region and, and a connection to the larger scale circulation that we should keep an eye on. So if there's still time left, quickly on question number two, um, how variable is the thermocline depth along the slope? That was the second thing that the, model, that the model experiment showed us that we need to rise the warm water at the slope uh, to, to, get, to get it in. And there have been already papers about that, also in particular in this region, showing that um, the circumpolar deep water, what it says is the pressure change per year, no, per, yeah, it's a pressure change per year. So, so this, this actually suggests that something is rising here. And that's uh, based on, on this black trend line. Um, I'm disputing this a little bit because I've been looking at exactly the same data set. 
And I found the first thing I found was that there is actually also a strong seasonal cycle. And now if you go there and look at this, this year, 1980, is actually the only year where you where you find some November data in this entire time series. And that's that's the that's what is standing out as a strong seasonal cycle here. So really we need to ask, is this is this a trend or is this seasonality? And I don't want to have a big fight about uh, about which paper is right or who, who has the right idea, but this just highlights we really urgently need to need to have a consistent or a time series of of the Antarctic slope front, uh, a good no, a good enough data to delineate things like seasonality from from trends and so on. So this is really where we need to put our thermometers in the ocean and, and look more carefully. Um, another thing noteworthy, and that's again about the the upstream change. Um, while Hartmut's paper in 2012 got a lot of attention, there's actually been another paper uh, from Kushahara in 2013, also attempting kind of a projection run. Um, and they find that there wasn't so much change in, in the Fujinoni region. They more found an increase in melting in the, in the Eastern Waddle Sea as uh, the second strongest signal next to changes in the Bellingshausen Sea. So there's, there's something about uh, model representation. Um, these are just two different uh, realizations of, of something that may or may not happen. Um, but I would like to take this a little bit further and claim that there's actually, uh, there, there's a connection between this. And uh, I may be not the first one, I may be not the only one thinking that. But um, uh, if, if you consider what what actually drives this slope front, what, what makes this water being pushed down at the shelf break, sorry, um, that is a, a momentum balance between winds that are continuously pushing water down here and uh, kind of an instability at this front that is trying to level out these, uh, these uh, density controls because uh, that is a, a, high, a state of high potential energy. So that potential energy wants to be released. And in, in a simple approximation, this actually depends on the density gradient between these two layers. So uh, the, the, the depth of the thermocline is, is a function of the density gradient. Now, there are other studies that are already telling us that the upper Southern Ocean density has been declining. And you could think that if you, if you rise the thermocline enough that you start melting of these upstream ice shelves, then you increase or then you introduce another feedback that, uh, that helps this uh, thermocline to become shallower simply because uh, you, uh, you increase this density gradient and then you don't need such a deep thermocline to store that potential uh, available, en uh, available potential energy in, in the front. So uh, th there's kind of this, this feedback mechanism and well, I try to show that in a very simple conceptual model where you already know the result of the experiments once you run the model. Um, but also if you run, an, if you run a, G, a GCM with high enough resolution and you either turn on ice shelf melting here or you don't turn it on, you actually get this effect that this warm water is transported into the ice shelf cavity when, when there is a freshening at the top. Whereas if, if you turn that off, there's basically no dynamic interaction across the sill. There's no water mass transformation here. So why should there be an overturning circulation? Um, so long story short, uh, if this is going to happen, this could actually reinforce the, uh, and this is happening because uh, surface waters are warming by the sun. This could actually reinforce the erosion of this front and the shallowing of the warm water at depth. Um, and that's something that Matthew Hoffman also seems to be finding in his uh, model. And there was this very nice cartoon that uh, was, uh, was around for it's almost two years ago or something, but I think, yeah. The, and, and he will probably, I mean, he's presenting here the 27th of July. Maybe he's talking about exactly that. Maybe he's talking about something completely different. Um, but uh, that's just another mechanism to highlight for changes at Fischeroni Ice Shelf. So, but the question is, what, what do we actually know about changes here? That was one mechanism. Um, we also have some time series 
And now we're really stepping back to my PhD because this is a more instituted under Fimbri shelf, um, right at, at Prime Meridian in 2009. And um, we have been lucky to just change batteries and these time series are still running. So um, since 2016, we actually do see some changes happening here. We do see some, uh, some warmer water coming in. And a few years later, uh, Avi started to build up on a, in a time series here in, uh, at the flank of the Fritzsche truck. And the changes seen here actually mapped, uh, mapped uh, further downstream onto that, onto that seasonality of warm inflows here. They have also become warmer. Um, and Avi just came back from a cruise here collecting more data and we will fly people to, to troll to collect more data here. So um, this is more an outlook than an answer. There's currently a PhD project at MPI looking at looking at this Fimble Eason uh, uh, time series uh, here again at the bottom. Again, making things like atmospheric composites, trying to relate that to uh, geostrophic velocities at the shelf break and, and so on, trying to find out. Um, I must confess the answers are not that straightforward uh, as, as it seems right now, but, but there seems to be there seems to be a pattern. So this is very much work in progress. And um, yeah, I think um, this is a lot what I wanted to show, just quickly wrapping up the main take home messages. There has been a high resolution modeling study that showed us to reach that tipping point to really increase that melting at Fisher on the ice shelf, you need to do two things. You need to remove that density barrier on the shelf and you need to lift the warm water uh, that, um, that can then flow into the cavity. So these are two strong changes that first need to happen. Uh, I get the feeling from these results that there's a bit of safeguarding for, for Fritsch and Ronnie. Um, and the second is that uh, the observations that we collected uh, suggest um, that there is a, that is dominantly wind-driven control on the strength of the density barrier through the sea ice formation at the Ronnie Ice Chef front. So it's really quite a, a long causal chain that you need to follow up here. Um, but I think if, if we look at changes in the Amundsen Sea Low and in particular the, uh, the cyclonic circulation pattern in, in this region in projections, in addition to any warming trends, I mean, they can also can suc come successively or whatever, that, that, is, that is a good idea to, to follow up to, to understand the fate of this ice shelf. So yes, I think that was what I wanted to tell. I spoke probably very fast and uh, I'm glad if you could follow some of this. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Tor, that was fascinating talk. Um, it was it was a lot all at once. It was very fast, but uh, really great work. Um, I'm going to ask first. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? If you do, please just um, you can either raise your hand or or you can submit something directly to the chat. Um, or if you're feeling brave, you know, go ahead and, and unmute. This is Laurie Padman. I'll ask a question. Uh, do the basal melt rates uh, validate the change in the melt rates that you predict from the circulation changes during the period you had data under the ice shelf? Uh, you think of our regional model simulations? Well, I'm thinking oh, of... Okay. of uh, data from either satellites or AP res, do they validate the models for that area? Um, I'm not currently aware of proper hindcast model simulations that capture this period so that we could compare it. Um, I, we have the P res data that is consistent with the observed circulation change. I try to look into satellite remote sensing melt rate changes 
if those are consistent with the circulation changes that we see, um, but the uncertainties were large so that we did not want to put, put too much trust emphasis on this. Um, does this answer your question? Yeah, sort of. I guess uh, you showed a time series that went back a lot further than the data that you had. So I'm wondering whether a, you know, whether, whether the signal to noise maybe in the satellite melt rate observations could be suitable for looking at least at, say, whether the 1990s were different from the period that you were intensively studying the ice shelf. Yeah. Well, I, I think actually I see in the satellite uh, melt rates, the, the change at the Filchner ice shelf front consistently with the AP rates that, that, that there is a decrease in melt rate in the, in the later years when it went back to the runner mode. Um, the tricky argument is then uh, could be a change in, in the accumulation as well. How can we delineate that? I have not looked into very long back uh, melt rate changes. Uh, because then all I have is is this, as you say, this time series of proxies uh, for sea ice formation rates. Um, one thing that is presented in Marcus Janot's paper is fearsome sea ice formation rates in, in the ocean model that is consistent with this time series. And then in the model, of course, there is a, a corresponding response of the melt rates as well. So it's more taking pieces from here and there. I mean, there are other studies that show once you have a stronger high-sensitive shelf water formation in the Ronde Polinia, you also do increase the melting at the deeper grounding lines um, and, and things like that. But that's, yeah, that's kind of putting evidence from different places, combining them together. Yeah. Okay. Um, this may be a bit of a, oh, is my mic on? Yeah, maybe a question, but, you know, uh, for those of us maybe who are working with lower resolution um, as system models who are not able to capture some of these uh, small scale uh, circulations very close in on the shelf in these specific regions, um, you know, are we hinting perhaps that maybe it would be useful to incorporate some kind of uh, sense of the surface wind field into into perhaps a parameterization of, of ice shelf melting. Have you have you thought about this kind of thing? It's a very, very speculative question. I hope you don't mind. No, it's uh, I mean it's an important thought in in Greenland this is this is much more advanced technology to get any predictions on the Greenland uh, terminus retreat, right? And when designing that forcing for the ISMIP six, we were discussing that a lot, how should we treat that? We can't really go there with the SEMA models, but if we take a downscaling scenario, which, which rep realization should we trust? That's, uh, um, so to take the winds directly to parameterize the melting, um, that will require very strong certainty about the mechanism, right? Mm. Uh, Mike Dinneman has a paper about increased wind speed along the ice shelf front, increasing melting right at the ice shelf front, whereas we here go through the CS formation and a two year uh, response time under the ice shelf circulation about the blocking time scale or whatever. So it's, uh, it's a very different mechanism. So I'm, I'm doubtful of a direct parameterization, but I think, and that, that's a very good point, we should be looking into the climate model, so into the, the uh, projection results to these indicators to see if we find consistent changes of these indicators. Does it look like that, uh, that we get uh, more or less uh, offshore winds in addition to a warming trend or whatever? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, really highlights the difficulty of representing these, these systems in, in our system model. Do we have any uh, other questions? Oh, we, Olga has her hand up. Yeah, great talk, Tor. Um, fantastic. Um, I hope you don't mind a question from a glaciologist. Um, so on your panels A and B, there are 
yellow errors in uh, Roni eyeshadow cavity. As the, how are they representative of the circulation in the cavity? Like, is it more complex or it's roughly those two branches that go around? Yes. Um, I think uh, this branch is now fairly established based on observations here and here and here. These two arrows are now confirmed also by observations. In earlier drawings, earlier papers, usually there's an arrow actually flowing this direction. Uh, but the but the moorings down here have, have uh, shown that this is wrong. There's actually a northward flow in this direction. This arrow is still something I have a personal dispute about with Keith Nichols, who was very doubtful about it. And I think our moorings show that it exists. Um, but yeah, I, again, when, when I got these questions in, in my reviews, why can't you put more weight on your current observations? Uh, it's really the water masses that can tell us how things change over an integrated pathway. Whereas we currently have seven places where we measure ocean currents for an ice shelf that has an aerial extent of the country of Sweden. So how much can you derive from that really? Yeah. I guess then my follow up question a bit like uh, fruitless. I was going to ask what your sense of the residence time of the water, like in the cavity, like how long does it take the, to complete the route from getting into it and getting out? Yes, uh, wait, sorry. Uh, that is actually, th there are um, uh, different time scales here. And we clearly see that these pulses that are produced here along this arrow, they are seen like three months or whatever later at site five, and then a few, more months later here, uh, or was it three, four months in total to here? I, I'm not sure, um, but that, that's written in, in, in this paper. Whereas Markus Janu shows um, circulation or residence timescales from a trace gas analysis, helium analysis, and he finds uh, uh, an outflow branch that probably took two years and an outflow branch that took, uh, that took significantly longer here. And, that is also my reason why I was insisting on this arrow, because we probably see two different timescales through the system. One fast one here and one slow one. Not sure where it goes around these ice rises, but that, that seems to go along this flank of the ice shelf. That takes actually, yeah, a, a few years, yeah. Okay, so the longest would be a few years, say a decade max. Yeah, like max, max a decade, yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Olga. Do, do we have any um, other other questions from the group? It's a rather quiet morning for some reason. I'll follow up with one more. So a, a lot of the sea ice production on the Ronnie side is right at the Polinia, right, which is a fairly narrow feature. So getting back to Craig's comment about uh, trying to get some of the processes into the larger scale models. Is, is there an easy way to at least get the sea ice production right in a climate model? Yeah, I'm not even sure I'm the right person to, to answer this in this group, but um, <clears throat> that's probably a good, good thing to look at. Uh, we're just playing around with an ocean model where we actually do not run a coupled ice model to it, but where we actually use satellite data to prescribe ice conditions. And my hope is exactly that, that we can, again, this model has a fairly high resolution, but that we can prescribe the presence of the coastal polinias and then uh, get that dense water formation in the right place at the right time. Did, did, uh, you, say, did you say that's work you're doing now or work that you're... Uh... No, that's work that it's very much in progress right now. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Uh, what kind of resolution is that? Um, well, it's an unstructured grid model, which goes from uh, one and a half to 40, 30, 40 kilometers or something like that. Yeah. For the Weddell so Gyre region. Yeah. This still is really out of the reach of, of like the m most sort of one degree Earth system model. Yes. Yes. 
This is also something that um, that uh, a group that I'm related to at MIT is interested in is, can we do anything to improve the representation of Polinius um, more in a, in, a, in a circumpolar sense? But it's a, it's a very tricky problem. And we're interested in, in you know, can we improve the representation of, of the surface wind field? Uh, how, however, we might do it. Looking at things such as, you know, is it possible to come up with something like a, a parameterization of catabatic wind or, or this sort of thing? And, and does that improve the, the Polinia? But, 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 but this, this is very, very early, uh, just beginnings to get into, into, into this. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, if we can if we can improve the representation of, of uh, specifically the Polinia in this region, maybe it was maybe it would uh, improve the climatology. But yes. I mean, there is there, there are so many other issues in low resolution models. Maybe this is not the leading one. I don't know. Yeah, I mean for for this region, uh, I guess then your model does have ice shelf uh, cavities. But for for the standard CMIP simulations, one problem is you you don't get the ice shelf water the below freezing point temperature water that that is uh, coming out from the ice shelf cavity on the shelf uh, in the first place. So yeah, there's a really different different things to look at. Um, another comment, maybe, on uh, the yeah, please. High sandy shelf water being mainly formed in in the narrow Polinia band. I guess it's again. This is again a, a discussion point. How much? How much does um, larger area thin ice uh, uh, the heat loss contribute to this, or like uh, sea ice thickness increase over larger area of thin ice? Uh, and to some extent, then this this proxy for sea ice formation rate that that I'm showing is is maybe just, uh, as I say, a, a proxy. Like when you have an open polynia, then you may also have more more other areas with thin ice where you also form ice. So that that the that the shape of the curve is right, but the but the absolute amount of what is being formed is maybe not not what we actually what we have there. Again, screaming a bit for maybe time series of of. Uh, Water mass changes in that Rone area, but that's so hard to get to. Yeah, I'm I'm not so much involved in the in the observation side uh, in this part of the world, but maybe someone like uh, Dave Porter could say something interesting about um, the, tra the trajectory of the community uh, in in producing this time series. Anyway, um, we're, we're uh, ever so slightly over noon here. Um, thanks again to all so much for, for um, speaking with us today. It was a fascinating talk. Um, I should have asked you earlier, um, so we like to uh, record these talks and put them on YouTube so that the community can, can watch them any time afterwards. Um, are, you, are you okay with this? Yes, I am. that's fine. Okay, so I just went ahead and recorded the talk, but by any means, if you don't want me to put it up, just let me know. I'm very happy to to, to not do that, of course. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I had some technical issues in, in in the first moments getting that going because I have two Zoom accounts. When I clicked on the Zoom link, it automatically logged me into my other Zoom account, and right, I realized yeah, I, see I couldn't yeah. I couldn't record it. So I I had a scary moment. I was like, ah, oh. so I had to go and turn all that on. Um, okay, Doug. Yeah, thanks again. No, and, yeah, uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm very glad for this uh, opportunity. I think this is the longest time I've been talking about this research, so that I spent so much time on. So yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. My my only comment is I wish that uh, we had more time because I think so much of what you're saying was really interesting, but it was very fast. I had at times difficulty keeping up with it. It seemed like you were many years work you were talking. Yeah. Yeah, really, really it is. That's uh, that's true. Yeah, no, uh, it was it was challenging to select. <laughs> I was wondering maybe uh, you, if you recommend any speakers that you would really like to hear from. Um, you know, I'm always happy to try and uh, to to uh, you know 
pass to people and get them to talk. Is there anyone yeah. that you would really like to hear from? Please let um, me know. I would be very yes, happy. Uh, uh, give me some time to think. I will definitely come back to I was just wondering how long is this uh, series uh, supposed to run? Is this like continuously going on or is there? Yeah. Yeah, I think until they tell us to stop uh, and, <laughs> and they, they seem to be supporting it so far. So. Right, right. Yeah, I'm hoping that it will be, you know, something, particularly as we're recording these talks, but it's something that's just like a rolling sort of conference that uh, will always be online uh, uh, forever. Um, so, that, you know, any anyone, even students or, or whoever can, you know, a lecturer can say, hey, there's this cool talk on the subject, you can check it out. I know, that sounds really nice. nice. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, well, I will come back to that. Um, let, me, let me think a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot. It was a, was a nice experience for me as well. OK, thank you very much. I hope you have a, a, a good rest of the day. Uh, yeah. there's, only, there's only us and Jeff left on. Yeah, thank yeah. you for the talk. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How are All you, right. Jeff? I'm, I, they, they haven't disconnected me yet, so we'll put that in the plus column. You know, They still let me have an account. So, um, and my random number generator is still working, so what more does a man need, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, do you have any interesting random numbers that you've generated recently? One that looks like pi, that might be useful. Um, well, 3.2 or something? Yeah, that's close enough, good enough. Go with it. Yeah. 3.7. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're keeping me busy. I'm juggling uh, four or five different projects. So it's, I'm going between uh, the dynamics people and uh, some of the planetary stuff and, and then looking at the AMOC collapse, then, um, uh, there's a geothermal simulation we're running, and then some early Earth simulations. So I'm bouncing back and forth between those four or five different things, um, you know. So, but you know, it keeps one on, on on one's toes. And in between that, I take a I take a I take a breather and I catch some of these talks to uh, clear my head and to see what other people are doing. Always. Uh, by the way, thank you for doing all this. Would, would, you, would you ever like to give a talk, Jeff? Excuse me. Would you like to give a talk? Would you be interested? Oh, I don't know if I have enough brain cells for this. Um, oh, come on. You can do this. <laughs> well, if I have any ideas, I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I what, yeah. What can I say? What can I, what can I say to twist your arm? Uh, uh, we've got a few free slots coming up. Well, next week's lottery numbers would help, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? Well, uh, we you know I, got... I don't I don't have any expertise in, in CI stuff or anything like that. So, uh, I think anything, I think you know anything interesting that you feel like talking about would be great to have you. Uh, the nice thing about sea level is I think you know with it, with enough um, arm twisting or or, or you know, gymnastics, I suppose you could relate almost anything to to sea level, right? <laughs> you, you, could talk, you could talk about AMOC stability, you could talk about anything. Yeah, I mean, the people I'm, I'm supporting with this stuff is, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I'm almost surprised they're not giving more talks. I, I, I constantly tell Mark and Linda that you guys are really good talkers. I mean, I hope I hear you more often. And now this AMOC CLAP study that I've been involved with with Natasha and David and Clara and... Um, and Ron is driving it. Ron is, I just, I just uh, sent them a whole bunch of plots yesterday uh and i'm working on some density animations for friday's meeting you know so i mean it's a lot of interesting stuff you know and then and then you know the early earth stuff is very interesting the planetary stuff so these all these scientists i'm working with they have all these really interesting topics so um yeah i wish i hear them talk more often so i i I take your point there's a lot of interesting stuff going on so So are you handing it off and you're saying that perhaps I should talk to uh, Ron and Natasha? Well, the the, uh, the scientists themselves I'm working with have uh, or have a more comprehensive uh, um, have more comprehensive knowledge of the particular topic. So like an example, like if I could start to get a guy to ask questions about stuff, I'd have to bounce a lot of that stuff off. Um, most of the stuff I'm getting is not my. Uh, is, I, mean, I get through. I get through osmosis from the from dealing with these projects, but I deal with the actual experts in particular topics. I'm not. An, I'm not an expert in any particular topic, so that's it. Makes uh, giving a talk me making me being not the ideal person in most cases. I gave a talk years ago about parallelization. I was first hired. Uh, in 83 to work on vectorization of the model. 
not mm. parallels, vectorization. Rado and I vectorized the model. We were running on a uh, Cyber 205 at Goddard Space Flight Center. It was, you know, it, it's like a crane machine, you know, vector. I don't know if you're familiar with vector machines. All right, it's a different way of high performance computing. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I, I'm not really familiar with the. Well, what you do is you, 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 you they have vector commands. So if you want to like, do an equation, you can repeat that equation, but with a whole vectors. But the computer has vector processors. So it goes many, so the larger the vector, the bigger your speed up. But these machines are tremendously expensive. So the Cyber 205 in 1983 was a $13 million machine. I don't know what it would cost today. Mm -hmm. But to give you an idea, our, our, our course resolution model, we got to run 35 times faster. Wow. Yeah, that was the number we got, 35. But that's what you would expect to get in a vector machine. You know, then a number of years went by, then I got pulled into the parallelization. So I, I parallelized the model with um, shared memory power parallelization. Not what we're doing now. There's two types of parallelization. There's shared memory and there's uh, message passing. Mm -hmm. And earlier on, the shared memory was, was the, the way to go because, you know, people didn't have access to hundreds and thousands of CPUs. They had access to a few, you know, maybe a couple dozen at the most. Well, with that, shared memory works fine. But mm -hmm. when you start getting more and more processors, the, uh, you know, the bandwidth starts, step, you start stepping on each other's toes, and, and, and it becomes hard, harder to do that. So then it was reparallelized using message passing. I did not do that. Somebody else did that. Uh, Tom Clooney, basically, I think, uh, did that at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So that could be done on a, on, a, on a distributed processor machine instead of a, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, using global memory, which in fact, that's what we had the old, uh, we used to have machines in house. I, I think they were probably gone by the time you got here, but they were SGI machines with, that had shared memory. That's, that sounds really interesting, but... Uh... But it's not the type of thing people want to hear talk about, but that's what, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds really interesting, but it's not the kind of things under the remit of the sea level rise seminar, I'm sure. Yeah. There's plenty of people that would, that would be interested to hear, hear, hear the talk, but it's not. Yeah, so I had, I had given, sea level science. Yeah, I had given talks about that. If I guess what happened when I, when I was, um, when I was working after I did the vectorization, I was, um, GIS got a machine that, uh, uh, that was really nice and novel at the time. It was a had color monitor, which is wow, a color monitor with 1024 by 1024 resolution. Mm. So I got tasked with the the job of writing a general graphics program to take climate model and making images out of color images out of it. <laughs> so I wrote that package. And so if you look at a lot of the earlier publications, you'll see some of these crude color plots that were all done on that because we only had one machine to do it. Then finally, the, you know, the computer industry caught up and, and we finally got Windows machines and color graphics all over the place. Mm. But then, uh, then Tony and David hired me away from systems to work directly for them. That's when they wanted to parallelize the machine with OpenMP, uh, pa parallelize the model. They wanted a version to do that. Mm. It was Tony and David. And the, the, the thing they had in common, uh, the, Tony and Eugenio and David, was they both wanted to increase the vertical resolution of the model. Tony being a cloud guy and David being a dynamics guy. Mm. And to do that, they needed to uh, the high performance computing. So they hired me to do that. Jim didn't want to pay for it. Jim Hansen didn't want to pay for it. So they hired me and I did it and we got it going. And then once we got it going, Jim liked it and took it <laughs> and made a production for everybody. So um, anyhow, but now, so now I run around, I do some, I support the various different topics, uh, different, uh, and so it's, yeah, I, I get my fingers in a bunch of different pies, but I'm not the master of, of many of these things. I, I, I'm in more in a supports, a support position. Yeah. So, I just, I just thought it'd be nice for like a community in a community sense to, to hear you speak, you know, cause you're like an important part of the community, even if it's not, uh, if you're not the lead on the project or whatever. It's just it's just nice to have people. So if you if you if you feel like ever speaking on one of Thank those you. projects, Thank you very much. Okay. please let me know. And I would love to I would love to uh, put you in. Um, but you know, no pressure. And also if there's anyone in the community that you think 
would be good to get in the series. Please let me know. Well, I'm encouraging the, some of the people I work with. I mean, like I say, I just had Ron, a, Clara. Um, Ron, well, not really Ron and Clara, but I, you know, Mark and David. I, in fact, I, I actually I just sat through a couple of talks, but that was more a closed uh, community thing. They were reporting to their bosses, but they gave uh, update presentations. And they're such good talkers, and the um, and some of the earlier stuff they do is really quite interesting. Anyhow, okay. um, yes. So, cool. I, I will that. remind. I will encourage them to keep talking. I'll, I'll I'll remind them that we have they have a platform that they can go to. How are you doing, by the way? Yeah, I'm still alive. Ups and downs. Um, okay. You know, yeah. I go I go crazy by myself in this tiny little apartment. Um, but it's much nicer than my old apartment, but, uh, but I do, I do go crazy by myself. You know, I'm one of these people that like, I really need, I'm quite sociable and I really need to have a lot of social interactions with people that I like. Um, and if I don't get that, I get a bit depressed and a bit crazy. Yeah, I hear uh, you. I'm, and I... I've been, you know, the, my, my girlfriend, bless her, like, you know, it's just a, it's a strain on everything sure. to, just to like only be spending all your time with one person uh so i'm super looking forward to things getting back to normal and hopefully mm -hmm. you know things things will things will get better the camera on so you can see yeah i'm but, seeing uh, i got it wrong yeah i have this uh you know uh hello you seem to have broken up there is that um I lost you for a moment. The, oh. the connection wasn't very good. Sorry, I'm not sure what you said. Oh, I, yeah, I got a message that says internet is connection is unstable. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyhow, what keep me, keeps me saying is um, I started this some months ago. It's like once a week I drive north. I have, fam I have family up north. I have elderly parents, and we have a lake house not too far from them. So I do is uh, like every, uh, during the weekend I drive up there. I visit my folks.